Chapter 7. It was my luck to have a few good teachers in my youth, men and women who came into my dark head and lit a match. One of these was Mr. Satish Kumar, my biology teacher at Petit Seminary, and an active communist who was always hoping Tamil Nadu would stop electing movie stars and go the way of Kerala. He had a most peculiar appearance. The top of his head was bald and pointy, yet he had the most impressive jowls I've ever seen, and his narrow shoulders gave way to a massive stomach that looked like the base of a mountain. Except that the mountain stood in thin air, for it stopped abruptly and disappeared horizontally into his pants. It's a mystery how, to me how his stick-like legs supported the weight above them, but they did, though they moved in surprising ways at times, as if his knees could bend in any direction. His construction was geometric. It looked like two triangles, a small one and a large one, balanced on two parallel lines. But organic. Quite warty, actually, and with sprigs of black hair sticking out of his ears. And friendly. His smile seemed to take up the whole base of his triangular head. Mr. Kumar was an avowed atheist. The first one I ever met. I discovered this not in the classroom, but at the zoo. He was a regular visitor who read the labels and descriptive notices in their entirety and approved of every animal he saw. Each to him was a triumph of logic and mechanics, and nature, and as a whole, was an exceptionally fine illustration of science. To his ears, when an animal felt the urge to mate, it said, Gregor Mendel, recalling the father of genetics, and when it was time to show its metal, Charles Darwin, the father of natural selection. And when he took to be bleeding, grunting, hissing, snorting, roaring, growling, howling, chirping, and screeching were but the thick accents of foreigners. When Mr. Kumar visited the zoo, it was to take the pulse of the universe. And his stethoscopic mind always confirmed to him that everything was in order, that everything was order. He left the zoo feeling scientifically refreshed. First time I saw his triangular form teetering and tottering about the zoo, I was shy to approach him. As much as I liked him as a teacher, he was a figure of authority, and I a subject. I was a little afraid of him. I observed him at a distance. He had just come to the rhinoceros pit. The two Indian rhinoceros were great attractions at the zoo because of the goats. Rhinoceros are social animals. And when we got Peek, a young wild male, he was showing signs of suffering from isolation. He was eating less and less. As a stopgap measure, while he searched for a female, father thought to, of seeing if Peek couldn't be accustomed to living with goats. If it worked, it would save a valuable animal. If it didn't, it would only cost a few goats. It worked marvelously. Peek and a herd of goats became inseparable even when some had arrived. Now, when the rhinoceros bathed, the goats stood around the muddy pool. And when the goats ate in their corner, Peek and Summit stood next to them like guards. The living arrangement was very popular with the public. Mr. Kumar looked up and saw me. He smiled and, one hand holding on to the rail, the other waving, signaled to me to come over. Hello, Pi, he said. Hello, sir. Good of you to come to the zoo. I come here all the time. One might say it's my temple. This is interesting. He was indicating the pit. If we had politicians like these goats and rhinos, we'd have fewer problems in our country. Unfortunately, we have a prime minister who has the armor plating of a rhinoceros without any of its good sense. I didn't know much about politics. Father and mother complained regularly about Mr. Gandhi but it meant little to me. She lived far away in the north, not at the zoo and not in Pondicherry, but I felt I had to say something. Religion will save us, I said, since when I could remember, religion had been very close to my heart. Religion, Mr. Kumar grinned broadly. I don't believe in religion. Religion is darkness. Darkness, I puzzled. I thought. Darkness is the last thing that religion is. Religion is light. Is he testing me? Is he saying, religion is darkness, the way he sometimes said in class things like, mammals lay eggs, to see if someone would correct him. Only platypuses, sir. 
There are no grounds for going beyond a scientific explanation of reality and no sound reason for believing anything but our sense experience. Clear intellect, close attention to detail, and a little scientific knowledge will expose religion as superstitious bosh. God does not exist. Did he say that? Or am I remembering the lines of later atheists? At any rate, it was something of the sort. I had never heard such words. Why tolerate darkness? Everything is here and clear, if only we look carefully. He was pointing at Pete. Now, though I had great admiration for Pete, I had never thought of a rhinoceros as a light bulb. He spoke again. Some people say God died during the partition in 1947. He may have died in 1971 during the war, or he may have died yesterday here in Pondicherry in an orphanage. If that's what some people say, hi. When I was young, your age, I lived in bed, racked with polio. I asked myself every day, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? God never came. It wasn't God who saved me, it was medicine. Reason is my prophet, and it tells me that at, as the watch stops, so we die. It's the end. If the watch doesn't work properly, it must be fixed here and now by us. One day we will take hold of the means of production, and there will be justice on earth. This was all a bit much for me. The tone was right, loving and brave, but the details seemed bleak. I said nothing. It wasn't for fear of angering Mr. Kumar. I was more afraid that in a few words thrown out, he might destroy something that I loved. What if his words had the effect of polio on me? What a terrible disease that must be if it could kill God in a man. He walked off, pitching and rolling in the wild sea that was the steady ground. Don't forget the test on Tuesday. Study hard. 314. Yes, Mr. Kumar. He became my favorite teacher at Petite Seminary, and the reason I studied zoology at the University of Toronto. I felt a kinship with him. It was my first clue that atheists are my brothers and sisters of a different faith, and every word they speak speaks of faith. Like me, they go as far as the legs of reason will carry them, and then they leap. I'll be honest about it. It is not atheists who get stuck in my craw, but agnostics. That is useful for a while. We must all pass through the Garden of Gethsemane. But if Christ played with doubt, so must we. If Christ spent an anguished night in prayer, if he burst out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then surely we are all permitted doubt, but we must move on. To choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. 